there is no uh, end game to stand up. I'd, I'd been a student of it enough to know. But if you're an, a person who evolves their philosophy, grows up with a generation of fans, and can kind of take the piss out of yourself, and in those Johnny Carson type moments, yeah, uh, reflect on it in real time. If you get that good. And I think that's where comedy can be storytelling and you don't really see the beginning, middle, and end. And that's what like being funny did for me was people didn't look at how skinny I was and worry about me because I was so funny. People like couldn't, didn't notice. I was like the class clown. I'm like, look over here, not at how I look like I just got out of Auschwitz yesterday. This was the gift that I was given. I'd have no idea why I can do it. But if you said to me, hey, go write me a hundred jokes about home security, I could do it. I could just take a piece of paper, whatever the subject, and I could, I don't know why I can do it. But so that's why it's a gift. I thought chaos was sexy and glamorous. You know when you see people that are just like in dramatic things and you're like, how how is that enjoyable to them? It is, it's a drug. Adrenaline turns into dopamine, it feels good. I wanted to be respected by the people in the stand-up community and wanted people to know that that's what I did. Mm. And I wanted to do, I wanted to play a dad on a sitcom. Even before I was a father, before I was married, before I was even old enough to play a father. Mm. That's always what I wanted to do. I got a legend sitting across from me, Dane Cook. Welcome to the show. Wow, man. That was like the wind up and I was holding my breath. I was like, <laughs> wow, this is, uh, thanks for having me on and thanks for uh, the flowers, man. You're the best storyteller I've ever seen. Oh, thank you. No, you are the best storyteller. And I've never watched like an hour go by with sort of just a few stories. And right. you're like, it feels sort of like one long bit that's exactly what it feels yeah. like was that with intent or does when you put your you know i, I have a lot of stand-up friends that kind of say i got good 20 minutes right now i'm working right. on the other 20 i'm working on the hook i'm sure did you, was that intentional to go that way yeah i think a lot of the stand-up that i loved growing up was the wrong moments the off-kilter moments the moments that seemingly were like up oh, man that's the that's the end of that rhythm. I actually like, example, um, before The Tonight Show was uh, Fallon, growing up it was Johnny Carson. He was mm -hmm. the Fallon. Yeah. And Johnny Carson could deliver the material, but when something went clunk, he came to life. Mm. And you saw something happen in the room and you felt it that was, uh, you couldn't take your eyes off him in that moment. And, and it was like, can he get back to the laugh? And of course yeah. he would. Yeah. And so I think I always looked at stand-up as, I'm never going to be a perfect stand-up comedian. I'm never going to master this. There is no uh, end game to stand-up. Mm. I'd, I'd been a student of it enough to know. But if you're an, a person who evolves their philosophy, grows up, with a generation of fans and can kind of take the piss out of yourself and in yeah. those Johnny Carson type moments, yeah. uh, reflect on it in real time. If mm -hmm. you get that good, then I think that's where comedy can be storytelling and you don't really see the beginning, middle, and end. Yeah, I also think it takes like tons of, I'll call it guts since this is a clean show, but like I speak for a living, right? So well, I don't know for a living, but it's one of the things I do. To go that long on a story means you got a lot of confidence where you're taking me because if it doesn't hit, you've taken eight or ten minutes up of the show that doesn't hit so <laughs> right that takes some real stuff right sure. to do that do you... and it takes a lot of time not getting quite to the where the end point is yeah there's you know it's kind of the cul-de-sac moment once in a while i call it where you go well this is lovely but where does this go <laughs> yeah, right right and so the pieces that you see if i if i do my job the way i i hope i presented it here is like i'm gonna sandbox each story mm. and we're going to find something that we call in comedy i'm sure you've heard it from your other comedy buddies is lpms mm. laughs per minute mm. and if i can fill a story out and i know where i want to take you but i can hit those laughs it's not a seminar or a monologue it's stand up oh very good yeah what made you do it at your house uh a few reasons mm. um well first and foremost when i moved in there 12 years ago it's i a baller pad by the way it's Movies a it's good. a beautiful you spot see, yeah and it's overlooking and it's just it looks like a treasure trove out there it's it's yep. glistening and i stood on my porch 12 years ago uh, i went through probably one of the most difficult moments of my life where i'd been come out of uh, a hardship a financial hardship and i almost didn't even know if i could keep my house i was in mm, such dire straits mm. but i stood on the porch and i was like not only am i going to work my ass off to um mm. my butt off sorry okay. uh to 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 keep this place but it feels like a stage up here. And mm -hmm. I already had been formulating the idea and where that came from was, I don't know how it was out here, but East Coast, you had somebody stoop, 
you had a weekend night, you had a few drinks, and you had neighbors congregating and stories flying and impersonations of each other. And yeah. next thing you know, it was like it felt like a little makeshift show on, on, a, on a front porch. Yeah. And I loved that. And I wanted to recreate that. As I like dove into you, my admiration for you really grew. I'm like, this dude has constantly had to overcome all kinds of stuff, <laughs> like all like really heavy stuff. And in the special, I was moved by many things. But your face also changes in the special. Like, I watched it twice, mm. and you tell the story about that Chevy Cavalier, by the way. I, I really watched, man. I love that okay. car. And you, you get this gig, and I think it's in Florida. That's right. And it's not paid. And you go, yeah, I'll go do it. And I don't want to tell the whole special away, but I just, We call it a hell gig now. The these, are the, gig. these are the- If you like comedy hell gig stories, yeah. then mine was either going to break me or, uh, you know- uh, it, incite me you know but everyone listen to this show everyone if you're listening to my stuff you want to do something great with your life you're either doing it or you're trying to do it and and you are going to have your version of this maybe multiple times right and then the crazy thing is then you may even get there and have it taken like you did that's right but can you and in not only that but you may get knocked down and get up and get knocked down and get up and then get knocked down and get up it's (laughs) like it isn't just a metronome rhythm of like, oh, if I take a knock, sometimes you can take a lot of knocks. A lot of them. And yeah. you've taken them. And I always say the difference between winning and losing is so small in life, in sports. We're talking football before we went on here. Yeah. It's almost too scary to look at. <laughs> and you were this close to going, I'm out. Actually, you did say it. So for sure. could you tell them a little version of what happened there, like with the hot dogs? And yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, I, so I tell this bit about, it's called the Rathskeller. And uh, if you end up listening to, to it. Uh, Everyone actually, listen. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be on Spotify as well, too. So the album yeah. will be everywhere. But if I would, I would love for you to see the special because I think aesthetically what Marty Culner did as my director is absolutely lovely. But it is. the bit is centered around when you're, so when you're a comedian on the come up, um, you know, there's no, there's no, um, dental, there's no, <laughs> there's no, there's no support, there's no union, there's no nothing. And you just take these gigs sometimes that are, they might be, you know, the middle of nowhere would make these gigs seem interesting. You know, you're mm-hmm. talking about places that seem like kind of insignificant, but it matters to get out on the road mm-hmm. and build that fan base. So mm-hmm. I tell the story of a, a humiliating, uh, bludgeoning, oh, gosh ego destroying maybe even ego defining if we wanted to get into psychology of it all um moment very early in my career where i was hired to do a gig at this place called the rathskeller from boston i drove to florida the story i tell is probably a condensed version of a 24 48 hours of my life where i was really rethinking everything mm-hmm. you know putting it out really in front of me and i'm sure you've had these great yeah. minutia conversations where you're really getting into beyond the nitty-gritty you're into the plankton of it all yeah. and you're going i do not have what it takes right now to mm-hmm. see this through yeah and to relinquish your power in that moment and know it's okay to know i don't have it all yeah. i don't mm-hmm. i don't but Maybe from that, I can recognize the pockets, the holes, the voids, mm-hmm. and start getting the education and information to fill those things in. Mm-hmm. But you need, to, you need to have it almost like break apart and crack apart yeah. and break you in order to go, oh, yeah, this is life. This is life. Identifying that, yeah. that um, void and going, I need material in there, not you yeah. know, comedy material. I need, I need stuff in there you know, to... It, um, uh, ad- adhesive yes for the dreams around it to come to fruition he basically quits and then like a few minutes later goes no i'm not out it's don't tell the whole ending no i won't i want them to see it but i mean the the thing about i'm kidding it's my, not the actual ending it's not the ending there's a little bit more after that but <laughs> my dad was an alcoholic and when he got sober mm. i finally got sober i said daddy are you never going to drink again he goes Mm, I can't tell you that. I'm just not going to drink for one more day. Mm. And when I was an entrepreneur, it reminds me of the story in the, well, I am an entrepreneur, but when I was struggling, right. which I still struggle sometimes, but when I was really struggling, I called my dad. I'm like, I don't have what it takes. Verbatim what you just said. I said the words. Mm. I don't have what it takes. I'm just not like these other guys. I'm just, I don't know. Like I, I want it, but I don't think I want it like they do or, wow. or there's something missing in me. I'm going to quit. Wow. And, wow. And my dad goes, uh, I go, Dad, I can't decide. I just want to do this forever. My dad goes, well, you don't have to. He goes, just don't quit for one more day. Mm. I just didn't quit that day. Mm. You know what I mean? I just didn't yeah. quit that day. 
And then the next day, the, kind of the emotion started to wear off, and my strength came back. And many, sure. many times, I'm like, I'm just not going to quit for today. You needed to be depleted. You almost needed yeah. to run your battery out completely. Yeah. To feel that feeling. Have you had that? Like, yeah. Multiple, you say, like, I've heard you say, like, what you just said about the void or, like, that space. Like, that's where you've got all your info. Right when you've at the end of something and failures where you've gathered most of your info yes. that's made you successful. Yeah, something about being completely a- annihilated sometimes emotionally. I think where you come back from that and start to recognize, or for me was, I don't need to do this the way that I think success is derived from i need to do my version of this oh. and take it to where my success will be Jeez, and that was definitive in that breakdown side of the road moment mm. what i say now and kind of the way i put it together and what i think is kind of an interesting sound bite is like when you're at your rock bottom i try to tell people don't be so fast to come up for air don't don't get the hell out of there so quick take a beat look around Except that you're in this rock bottom moment because there's so much data and failure. There's so much wealth of information in hitting that lowest moment that when you finally come to the surface, those are gems that you've brought up with you. And you only get them at your most broken, down at the bottom moment where you're not just on one knee, you're down on both trying to figure out like which end is up. You need it. You need that. Nikki Glazer, welcome to Max Out. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here. And I'm so honored that you did reach out to me because although I wasn't familiar with you prior to that, once I got researching, I was like, this guy is doing everything that is up my alley. I've already, just in preparing to be on your show, I've listened to a couple podcasts. And as I was telling you, I already feel the winds of change from (laughs) some of the info you've exposed me to. So one of the other things about you, just for what it's worth, everybody, that surprises me about you because you are so successful. Everyone, she's being very human with you. And then just so you know, she's on the spinning earth, one of the most immensely gifted and talented people in the world at what she does. So she's being really real with you, but then there's this other side where there's this genius. We all have a genius. It can be our kindness, our physical beauty, our intellect, our humor. She's got a genius, and, and I'm talking like one of maybe four or five people, and in my mind, number one at what she does, but yet you care a lot about what people think about you still. I know. So like this whole Taylor Swift thing that happened. <laughs> Just tell them what it is, and then yeah. tell them why are you that way? You're a millionaire. You're famous. You're amazing at what you do. Your peers love you, and let's just be honest, guys. One of her things is she's kind of like, hot when she's a comedian too right like there's an element of that so it's not as if you've gone through life being an unattractive woman is what i'm getting at but i feel as if i am and i deep down i am and you can put a lot of makeup on me and get the right ring light and have the shimmer and the but it i feel it's an illusion. I mean, there are times when I do feel beautiful and I look in the mirror and I say that to myself and I truly believe it. And then I see a picture five minutes later and I'm pushed off my pedestal. I mean, it, I just, I really struggle. I struggled from an early age of just feeling ugly and not feeling good, comparing myself just based on looks to other people and feeling like that was all that I was worth. And it's taken me you know, finding other paths to get the attention by being super funny. Okay. See, people don't look at me as much. Um, Mm -hmm. and that's, and that's what like being funny did for me was people didn't look at how skinny I was and worry about me because I was so funny. People like couldn't, didn't notice. I was like the class clown, like look over here, not at how I look like I just got out of Auschwitz yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so it was a defense mechanism. I, and then I even struggle with being known as like a pretty comedian because I did, when I started, I was young, like I was 19. And so I, and I was good out of the gate. Like I was decent and I had promise. And I think a lot of my, um, like now I think, oh, I'm just successful because I was the young, pretty, funny girl. And now I'm like, okay, now I'm aging. What if the prettiness goes away? Even though I don't really believe it, but that's what people say, but it goes away. Now, am I going to be funny enough without, being pretty too, like what's aging going to be about. I don't worry about, I do worry about what people think about me. I mean, I just think that that's, uh, it's something I work on because, and I care less as I age. I really do. The Taylor Swift thing wasn't about me caring what 
other people thought it it was about me caring about what i thought see what happened was i did i, I love taylor swift maybe more than any anyone in my my age sh uh should she just makes me feel like a young girl again i really could have used her music when i was growing up like i tend to make comedy for myself when i was 15 i just feel like that was a time i could have really used some more guidance in my life and i my biggest dream is to have like girls like trading my videos like secretly their parents won't let them watch it but they like learn stuff about what it's going to be like when they get older through me because i yearn for any of that and taylor swift has been that for me i just love her music i relate to it so much and i'm not even talking about her recent stuff like her song about being 15 and losing her virginity like the the, the fear of that song still resonates with me and so i um I love her and I talk about her a lot. And so she had this documentary that came out um, this past January and it was kind of exploring, uh, it was kind of uh, dealing with why she went away for a year. She kind of had too much media attention. It got too bad, got too much for her, overwhelmed and she went away. Not all that it, different than what you're describing. Yes, yeah. I had really, on a much smaller scale, like just being overwhelmed. I can't even believe she went away for a year when I heard that I was like, oh, you could go away for a year. Like, what if they don't remember you? And it's like, that's like my biggest fear. So I'm already like in awe that she did that. But then in the film, I'm watching the trailer. It dropped like January 21st or something like that. I remember I was in bed watching the trailer because I was so excited to see the trailer for this Netflix documentary. And I hear my voice in the trailer and my voice is used in a scene to set up the fact that she like ha it's too much too many m m people having opinions about her and i said she's too skinny all of her model friends i don't like it it was just something like that i knew it was my voice right away i called all my friends and i was like listen to this trailer i'm in this i'm in this documentary i'm i'm sure of it and this is terrible like whoa, whoa, whoa. I, i'm gonna look like this is so ironic i'm her biggest fan and yet right. i'm trashing her right and so my friends were like, that's not you. I was like, I know it's me. I know my voice. And um, I waited a week till the movie came out and then it came out and sure enough, I'm in the documentary saying exactly that and it's my face and everything. And I just felt like gross. Like it just it wasn't, what I said wasn't funny. It was just critical. And it was so funny to me because I judged her for the things that I, I would, I, I wish I were too scared. Like I, I always love when people are like, are you okay? It's like validating to me that like, I'm doing things right. Like if someone calls me too skinny, I was just projecting. I was jealous that she was so skinny. I was jealous that she had model friends. It seems like, oh, she only has model friends. I'll never be friends with her. And it just like was like, ugh, it was a bad look. And I honestly love Taylor Swift. And I know that she would not, she didn't see that before the documentary. It was in the documentary. She only saw it once it was chosen for the film, but she saw it. She saw me mouthing off and it just felt gross. So I wrote her an apology on Instagram because I knew that was the quickest way to get her to see it. Yeah. And she did, and she forgave me. And you know, I she haven't heard really from her since. You. She forgave you. She wrote back, yeah, and she was like, she wrote, "Oh my gosh, thank you so much." And she wrote like, because it was all about her. She she was anorexic, and I was. I mean, the the irony is, it's crazy that I was the bully for the anorexic girl, and. So uh, she even said, like, I'm so, because I even said, you know, I've, I've suffered with the same things that she has, and I can't believe I'd be one to judge her for it or comment on her body at all. Because it was like, ugh. And I just, I wanted to clean up my side of the street. I just wanted to feel, yeah. it didn't matter if she forgave me. I really didn't care. I just posted it and, like, I, right after it, I was able to listen to her music again, which I wasn't able to listen to for a week because I was like, I'm such a bad Taylor Swift fan. She's done so much for me and I like slander her. Like I just was consumed by just guilt that I had made someone, it'd been so judgmental and, and it just made me look at my shit talking self and be like, you need to stop. You need to calm down to quote Taylor Swift. And so yeah, it, that's, that's why I did it. I was just like, I, was I don't like this side of myself. People that I know that know you tell me, like, they obviously how talented you are. And then the next thing is, she's such a really good person. Mm -hmm. And I say that, I say that for this reason. And I'm talking about like multiple people. Like, it's the, they go, she's unbelievable. And man, she's a really good person. Why do I tell you all this? You're, most of the people listen to her try to make their dream come true. I hope you've got two things at least so far. And I hope you got like 50. Hmm. One, good people can win. Two, imperfect people win. A lot of you think, well, I've got this fear, or this insecurity, or this weakness about me, or this secret. I've got this secret that if everybody knew, you know, I did this in a relationship, or they knew what I do behind the scenes, if they really knew how bad or pathetic or screwed up I am, 
you think that discounts you from winning somewhere else. And it's not true. Most of us that won, we're pretty screwed up. Yeah. Most of us that have won. And so these, your mess does not disqualify you from making your dream come true. It doesn't. In fact, it's a qualifier for making your dream come true. Jeff Foxworthy, welcome to the show, brother. I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me, Ed. Yeah, I got to tell you, you're special. Everyone, you got to go watch the good old days. It's one of the few things, Jeff, that my wife and I actually agree on when we watch art or comedy. Usually, I'll watch a comedian. I think they're really, really funny. She's like, ah, I just don't get it. You know, and then, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then right. there's stuff she loves. I'm like, this is terrible. Turn this off. I can't do an hour of this, right? So <laughs> I, I got to tell you, one, it's clean for everybody who wants to listen to something that's clean, but it's very rare, man, in my house that we both agree something's funny, and this special was definitely it. So well done. Well, yeah, my wife and I have those shows. Like sh she likes some of them that I go. You know what? I'm on the road next weekend, so why don't you save that <laughs> until I'm on the road and you can watch that? Because this <laughs> ain't doing nothing for me. So yeah, same deal, man. So I want to talk about you a little bit. We'll talk about the special too, but you know, you're, I'm always fascinated. So is my audience with people that have become mega successful at something. I call it max out. They've maxed out a particular area of their life, whether that be family or business money, their career, you seem to have done that in a bunch of different areas. Yet, as I dug into you a little bit, you don't really come from that. Not so at all. Let's, let's just start with, cause I think it gives people hope. I mean, uh, these stats were true guys. Number one selling comedy album person of all time. It's not like I needed to introduce them. Everybody knows who Jeff Foxworthy is. So something good's happened there. But your dad was kind of an interesting dude, right? Tell him a little bit about your dad and where you come from. My dad grew up in the country in Georgia, uh, a little town called Sandersville, um, and went to work for IBM. Um, and so he met my mom. They got married. My, my dad was a character in that. He was a good dude, but when he was five years old, his dad literally went out for a pack of cigarettes and never came back. And so that, you know, that did something to him. And so he ended up leaving when I was young. He, he ended up being married six times and had a thousand girlfriends in between. My wow. mom went to church five times a week and, you know, didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't cuss. And so they were total polar opposites. Mm -hmm. um, but there's something that happens to you as a kid no matter what your parents say, when, when one leaves you, you feel like you weren't worth sticking around for. Um, and, and no matter what they say, that's what you feel deep down inside is I wasn't worth sticking around for. And so kind of early in life, I was like, all right, if I ever have kids, my kids aren't going to feel this way, you know? And, um, I, I didn't, I, I, I was always fascinated by comedy. Um, when I was a kid, I used to buy comedy records and memorize them and go to school and do them. Mm -hmm. Looking back, it, it I, I totally believe it's a God-given gift. This was the gift that I was given. I'd have no idea why I can do it. But if you said to me, hey, go write me a hundred jokes about home security, I could do it. I could just take a piece of paper, whatever the subject, and I could, I don't know why I can do it. But so mm -hmm. that's why it's a gift. Yeah. is the same way other people can create music or the same people, the same way people can make a brick wall that just looks beautiful. You know, it's their gift. Yeah. And yeah. so I can't even have ego about it because <laughs> I mean, I really can't, I don't know why I can do it. I love it. I'm mm -hmm. so thankful that I've gotten to make a living doing it and I've worked at it. I mean, I, I, I felt like, all right, you've, you've been entrusted with this. You're the steward of this gift. What are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. And so I always worked really hard at it, you know? Um, what well, do you think there's I, any keys to being a good storyteller? I'm just curious. Cause I think the, the ability to tell a story transcends everything. Almost. It makes you a better father, mother, business person, salesperson, stand up actor whatever it might be telling a story is a really important skill in life that most people i don't think ever realize they probably should get pretty good at Did you you're, i think you're 100 right um it, we all know somebody at work that's like a great joke teller and somebody that's a terrible joke teller and i think yeah. the good one they learn to keep in the things that only the things that are needed yeah. the people that are not good at it throw in all these ingredients that you don't really need to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, but there is an art to it. And I think part of it is being interested in stories. You know, you're that guy. You're, you want to know somebody's story. Mm 
Yeah. Everybody I, I meet, I'm like, so what's your story? Where are you from? You know, where, I want to know where'd you grow up? How how'd you grow up? Because yeah, I'm interested. Yeah, same here. I think that that's especially in sales. I tell people all the time, like less is more. You know, even bingo. doing the show, I, I, bingo, bingo. I think they add too much to their pitch because the more when you're in business, the more you know, the more you add to the story, the more you think you need to tell them. You know more facts. You know more information. Just. Just get to the point. But I want to go back just for a second because I think it was a really powerful thing you said. You said that no matter what you, happens when you're a parent in this divorce situation, that when you leave, that that child feels something they shouldn't feel. I heard you say that you really grew up feeling like you weren't worth staying for. And I was, I'm, I'm honest with you, Jeff, I was driving in my car prepping for this, you know, I listened to different stuff. And I started to like get all filled up in the eyes thinking about there's probably a lot of men right now, not just men, women too, but they're thinking right now, maybe I'm going to leave my family and, yeah. and go get a new one, get something shinier and newer or younger or less drama. Or what, what would you say to someone who's thinking about maybe right now thinking about doing something like that? Who's got babies or kids at home? Not even about your spouse. What it does with your kids is it, is it breaks a trust, you know, and, and, Trust is a weird thing. If I, I, I'm a visual guy, so I imagine it like a coffee cup, and it's built just a drop at a time, a drop at a time, and it fills up with trust. But when you lose trust, you dump it all out. Of, it, it's all gone in one second. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens when parents leave their kids, is their kids look at you and go, crap, I thought it was you and I, I, I thought it was you and I above anything else. And if it's, and you can walk away from me, then even though we might repair this, you're going to see where the glue was because there was a big trust broken here between you and I. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I would encourage people to really think about that before you do it. And I know people get in situations where it's just unbearable, but the, the, you you always think about the husband and the wife it's the kids that carry the most of it mm -hmm. through life um you know before covid hit i had spent 12 years uh leading a men's group on tuesday mornings at the homeless shelter in atlanta mm -hmm. and most people end up in a in a homeless shelter because of some type of addiction mm -hmm. is but the longer that I worked there and got to know these people, what you realize is something bad happened to them early in life. Yeah. They either got abused physically, sexually, or they got abandoned. Something bad happened to them. And the hurt was so great that they couldn't deal with it on their own. So as they got older, they started numbing to it. Might be with alcohol, might be with drugs, but they started numbing to it. Well, when you're doing that, you're not employable. You're not somebody that a company can depend on. Yeah. So you're not employable. You can't have your own space because you can't pay for your rent. So you're hanging around with your friends and your family and you're taking from them to the point where they go, no more, I can't do this anymore. And that's how people end up on the street. And so the, the addiction is just the symptom. The, the diseases that hurt that happened when they were young. And so if you can ever go back and deal with that hurt, and, and drag it out of that locked up basement room in the soul and pull it up the stairs and pull it out in the front yard and let the sun hit it and call it what it was. Then they had a chance to get better. They had a chance to put their life back together. I'm so glad Whitney Cummings is on Max Out today. Welcome, Whitney. What an honor. How nice. Fine. What is this? I don't know. I think it's just about the chase for you. I'm an enigma to you. You want what you can't have. I can't be this great. I can't have. Well, <laughs> at least I have it for an hour today. By the way, I think if you're if you're on audio, she's got pink hair mm -hmm. today. And I'm reading about you because I it's obviously your IQ kind of shines through. You're Ivy League educated. Yes, sir. Why no, okay, you want your fans to hate me? Why no. open with this? No, I, I think it's an interesting I don't know, duality that, you know, you're able to do comedy. You're obviously, <laughs> some people think you're very pretty and you, so I'm a married man, so I say it that way. <laughs> uh, but like, I'm like, her IQ's through the roof. It's obvious the way that you communicate about things. This, this interview today, guys, isn't going to sound like you're just talking to a comedian. You're going to, this. when I say just a comedian, I just mean there's such depth to you. But then I'm researching, I'm like, 
she, she went to Penn for God's sake. She's Ivy League educated. It's starting to make sense. So yeah, I, I, I definitely think a lot of what I have achieved is because people just had such a low standard for me. That is a no. big, that is a big part of success. Just make sure the bar is so low that you're always going to exceed it. <laughs> well, I have a huge bar for today. So let's step up here. So Oy. I, I was reading about you and it's weird. Like you just feel like you connect with people. And I grew up in a uh, alcoholic family, my dad. And I have this theory, my first job out of college after I got released from playing baseball, I worked at a group home, like an orphanage for boys. And I developed, all my boys were all wards of the court. So their, their parents were either dead, incarcerated, or had probably like molested them. And I had this, developed this theory by working with my boys that people that come from a certain level of dysfunction, I think our eyes are a little different. Like we just want to be loved and believed in and cared for. Everybody does, but maybe we want it a little bit more and we link achievement to doing that too, I think sometimes. But your upbringing is not all that dissimilar. So just give people context to maybe a little bit about your upbringing, which might explain a little bit of the other parts of your life. Well, I just want to say really quick a response to that because, um, you know, you're being so authentic and vulnerable and your fan base, you know, must obviously respond and relate, uh, which is why they're, you have such a rabid um, fan base. But yeah, I mean, I think if you worked hard for approval when you were young, you work hard the rest of your life. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of, um, I used to look at growing up in an alcoholic home as, you know, I was a victim and poor me. And, you know, I now look back at an alcoholic, just, you know, as you said it, I felt the need to clarify alcoholism, you know, we say in order for alcoholism to be present, alcohol doesn't always have to be present. Addiction shows up in many different ways, where it's a mom that's obsessed with cooking or cleaning, or if it's an obsession with making Christmas perfect, or if it's a love addiction or a drama addiction, or a, you know, parents fought. Alcoholism, sometimes people think that they had to like see a whiskey bottle for alcoholism yeah. to be present. So you saying dysfunction, I think was you know, important, but um, uh, so that people don't feel like, oh, I think I had chaos, but I didn't. A lot of people yeah. like to minimize their trauma or experience because there wasn't uh, a, a drunk in the house. Yeah. Um, we can be drunk on rage. We can be drunk on control. We can be drunk on uh, perfectionism. We can be drunk on anxiety and all sorts of things. Another person, a behavior, you know, we see it now with social media addiction shows it's, um, you know, uh, we can be addicted to a lot of things besides just actual alcohol. So it, it took me a while to yeah. understand that because I didn't see a lot of alcohol growing up. Uh, I didn't realize I grew up in an alcoholic home until much later. I just thought my parents fought a lot. I just thought they were, um, you know, uh, like that. I just thought my mm. mom went to bed at 6.30. I, I like, I, you know, really? it's, it's like, as a kid, you don't understand what's happening, you know, you, and, yeah. and, and, and we're amazing. Our brains are amazing. You know, I know you had Dr. Huberman on about, um, uh, and talked about uh, brain plasticity. Like we yep. can adapt to a f crazy situation very quickly yeah. and we can make up our own narrative about what's happening. Mom's yeah. tired. Mom has a headache. Like what, we don't know what alcoholism is when we're yeah. five. We believe yeah. our parents, they're heroes, you know? So, um, but I, when you grow up in an alcoholic home or a dysfunctional home, you end up having to work a little bit harder uh, to get attention. You end up having to be funny. You end up having mm. to pretend you're sick or pretending you're hurt or mm. taking risks or being loud or all these sort of um, uh, maladaptive uh, behaviors. Sometimes they're called character defects. I like to call them superpowers because I, as I get older, I'm like, God, I, I have all these freaking tools and weapons and superpowers that a lot of people don't have. Um, and so I don't know. I'm one of those adversity is good people. That's incredible. You say that I got interviewed on Friday and I said, it, it just occurred to me at almost 50 years old that these are actually, I use the word superpowers of mine. Superpowers. And I think you talk about anxiety. I don't know if you agree with this or not, but like, there's all this notion, like you should avoid all anxiety, avoid all stress. But, and I think there's an element that you should avoid some of it, but also these things are like signals for growth, signals for improvement. They're like catalysts for change too, right? Like I don't want to have a life completely devoid of stress, completely devoid of anxiety. It's kind of like, I think the contrast of emotions makes life a little bit richer or do you like totally disagree with that? No, I mean, no, we're brats. We're total brats. And mm -hmm. there's this uh, war on anxiety as if it's mm -hmm. something we should get rid of and cure and fix. And yes, there are legitimate anxiety disorders. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. I have someone in my family that has a debilitating, can't get out of mm -hmm. bed. Anxiety disorder requires medication. That's not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like this thing of I should never have anxiety, you know, 
we say in, um, you know, I'm not an AA, I'm an Al-Anon, but in 12-step mm -hmm. programs, we say alcoholics are the only people that believe they deserve to be happy all the time, that they should be having fun all the time. Like that's <laughs> this. And I think we're all like these petulant children now who are like, I should never have anxiety or fear. Yeah. Like anxiety and fear are why our species has prolif have proliferated. It keeps us safe. Anxiety, this is our friend. Anxiety gets us out of bad situations, gets us out of bad relationships. It's our, on one hand, people don't realize how hypocritical they are when they talk about this stuff. They'll be like, trust your gut. I, I, get away my anxiety. It's like, they're the same thing. Your mm. gut anxiety that is your gut speaking to you it's important mm. information you know anxiety mm. motivates us it moves us like you just said um it informs us it tells us whether someone's good for us or bad for us whether we should lean into a situation or lean out of a situation so and also sometimes i think people conflate conflate anxiety and excitement anxiety and nervousness there are a lot of things that we should absolutely be anxious about right now you know like the, it'd be weird if we weren't mm -hmm. like we'd be numb zombies like mm -hmm. um we have this new petulant thing where we never think we should be uncomfortable. Like it's yeah. a healthy reaction to be anxious about money. Like you should be, if you're not, then you're delusional. That's worse. So mm. if you have $10 in your, if you just overdrafted your bank account, you should feel anxiety. <laughs> yeah, right. You right. If you don't, then you're delusional. So I would rather ha have anxiety than delusion. <laughs> I watched you say something. And it hit me because I don't know that I've broken this completely. You said, I think I was almost like unconscious in my 20s. Yeah. Meaning like, you know, you're, and I'll let you explain what you meant by it. But in my version of it is like, I've always just been going. And I thought, you know, I've teach people all these tools. I thought like, am I really over that? Like, am I still as present and as conscious as I could be? And I think a lot of achievers listen to my stuff or at least want to be achievers. And they're addicted to this. Yeah. You know, one of the things Huberman probably said on your show too is like, turns out you get more dopamine in the pursuit of something than you do when you achieve it. So this notion that I have to keep getting things. But for me, it was like, if I can get there and then this next one, this next one, this next one. And I look back now and I always want to say to people, because I'm one of the older people now in the space, like I wasn't present enough. I did not enjoy the ride as much as I could have. What changed for you if it did in your 30s that you didn't do in your 20s? You know, for me in my 20s, I was unconscious. You know, I was a complete puppet of fear and workaholism. And um, I was a little bit of a zombie. You know, uh, I thought the only thing, uh, you know, I equated, you know, productivity with my self worth. I derived yeah. my self esteem from productivity. Still do, just the motives are a little cleaner. You know, mm -hmm. it was a, it was when I was in my twenties. Uh, I didn't know how to measure twice, cut once. I was working ten times as hard, not working smart. I just wanted to keep busy because I was in pain, and mm -hmm. I was so desperate to make it. I was so desperate for approval. I was so desperate to be loved that I was just a sort of um, unconscious, like Tasmanian devil, just like am I this person? Am I this person? You know. Mm -hmm. um, running from whether it was relationship to relationship, from job to job. Um, I also was just grew up without money. I didn't have money. So I was also mm -hmm. just trying to make money. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I think it is, who was it was saying that um, your IQ goes down when you're worried about money. Al, uh, Andrew Yang, who I think you're having on soon. Um, yes. And I don't know who did the study, mm -hmm. not a scientist, but when you're worried about money, your IQ does go down. Um, mm -hmm. So I also wow. was so scared of mon uh, not having money but also at the same time, spending irresponsibly and, um, <laughs> you know, had a shopping addiction and all that. So I, I, I personally, um, uh, you know, <laughs> I know people are going to make fun of me in the comments. <laughs> I do identify as an addict. I know I say that on every podcast. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to be going like, this is just how women are. This is just how, you know, people that grew up in alcohol homes are. Like I, I very much identify um, as an addict. So I was, I was very addicted to drama. I was in bad relationships. I was cheating. I was recreating my childhood circumstances subconsciously. I was recreating uh, that wow. familiar pain, you know, yes. who is it that said, I'd rather have familiar pain than unfamiliar comfort. Like yes. I, I, I would, you know, I grew up in chaos. I grew up with adrenaline and cortisol. I yeah. You know, you know, when you see people that are just like in dramatic things and you're like, how, how is that enjoyable to them? It is, it's a drug. Adrenaline turns into dopamine. It feels good. Yes. And I didn't know serenity. I didn't know calm. And, wow. you know, there was this one quote that I, um, uh, I'm going to pretend I'm smarter than I am. <laughs> 
Flo, does Athena want to look this up? Flaubert. Flaubert was a philosopher who said, be serene in your personal life so you can be violent in your work. Wow. I want to say. Wow. I thought my life had to be chaotic to like be a good artist. I mm -hmm. thought I had to like, you know, for life to imitate art, your life has to be wild so that your art's wild. Like I just had this really romanticized um, idea of like, I actually now know that the most successful people are the most boring fucking people <laughs> so true. that have the most regiment. And I look at you and like, I, as I was doing some research on you and I'm like, of course he's been married forever. And is in a really, of course, because you cannot be on dating apps all day and be chasing women and being in acrimonious relationships and like fighting with people and throwing phones across the room and achieve what you've achieved. Mm. So I hadn't learned, I associated success with chaos. Mm. I was like, oh my God, all these like famous actors and directors, they, you know, and actresses, they have 10 husbands and they, you know, cheat on their, in their, I thought chaos was sexy and glamorous mm -hmm. and that's what success was david a arnold welcome to the show hey man i'm so excited to be here man you are uh, right now blowing up you got the nickelodeon show yeah you got your tour yeah you got the netflix special you're yeah. doing a movie right yeah. now like yeah. you're the dude yeah and it's yet, working you're this overnight success that took 27 <laughs> freaking years i know so so take us take, take us back a little bit because i just think this is one i think they're inspiring people yeah. but then i think there are people who have lived inspiring lives you're both wow and so Thanks. so yeah. so did it really take you 20 plus years to actually really make a great living and break through doing this no it did yeah. not it didn't take 20 to make a great living it, yeah. it it's been i've been making a really good living for about 10 years you okay. know because i've been writing and producing television from house of pain and meet the browns for tyler perry to real husbands of hollywood for kevin hart fuller house on netflix the reboot of that I mean, I've I've written and produced a lot of television for a long time. And now, you know, with the show that I created, That Girl Lele, that's uh, on Nickelodeon and got picked up on Netflix, which is like the number one show mm -hmm. on their network, is killing, you know, creating that show made me only the sixth black man in the history of TV to have a soul created by credit of a TV show, yeah. which I didn't even know until it happened, you know, sure. when Will, Will Packer called me up to do it. So I've been making a living Sure, you know, a good living for a minute, but like now to the point where I'm starting to, people are starting to put my face with the comedy. Yes. That's been in the last couple of years, the pandemic, social media. It's, mm -hmm. I tell people this all the time. It's never been one thing. Mm -hmm. It's been a lot of little things that I've consistently done, mm -hmm. but all driven towards the same goal was this the goal? So for, so first off, so about a decade making a good living, yeah. but public notoriety that people walk down the street and go, hey, there's David A. Arnold. That's yeah. been recent. That's been in the last couple of years. Last couple of years. Yeah, and like, so was this the plan? Did you always want to do stand-up? Did always. you want to write or did you want to do all of it? Uh, stand-up and uh, two things I've wanted to, when I came to town that I wanted to do, which was 25 years ago. I wanted to do stand-up. I wanted to be known for doing, I wanted to be respected by the people in the stand-up community and wanted people to know that that's what I did. Hmm. And I wanted to do, I wanted to play a dad on a sitcom. Even before I was a father, before I was married, before I was even old enough to play a father. Mm. That's always what I wanted to do. And, you know, that's one of the things about your special I just want to say to you. I love, I think I love it for a couple of reasons. One, I love, I get emotional, I don't know why I'm saying this. I love how you are open and honest in how you talk about your family. Yeah. And yourself as a father. <laughs> yeah. I also think if I'm being honest with you, I think there's a layer to it that I respect and admire more and that there's a something beautiful about a black man also doing that on stage talking about his yeah. family and his children is that mm -hmm. were you conscious of that like i want to make sure that i've honored my wife and honored my children as i've got this far down the road or was it just that it's just so damn funny you talk about it i think it's probably a combination of both hmm. you know i've always thought that what is going on in my house is hilarious and ridiculous and painful mm. at times, you know, <laughs> as it is. And I think it was the same way growing up. Mm. I knew, you know, I bring my my wife and children out on stage with me at the end of my special. Yes. And I, I decided to do that, like somewhere in between my tour when I was preparing to film the special, I was like, I was just running on a treadmill. And that's where I do a lot of my thinking when I'm working out, right? And it's something just said, you know, people know me already and people who follow my social media, my Instagram and stuff, and Facebook and all that, they they know me and my family because I've been posting videos for the last couple of years that have just exploded. Viral videos. Right, it's just unbelievable. And 
I was like, they already know this world. I'm about to go out on stage and talk about this world. Mm -hmm. Why not bring the people out that I'm talking about? It's beautiful. And that has resonated with people more so much that even the documentary that's attached to the end of the special even makes more sense. So I, I think it was it was a conscious thing, but it was also an organic thing mm. that just made sense. Yeah. I love the documentary at the end, which we're going to talk about a little bit. It's really sure. cool to hear someone talk about their life and then actually see the actual people at the end. That was brilliant that you did that. Thank you. But I want, you said something in the special. So here we go, guys. We're going to get into the stuff that's going to like, you're going to go, okay, this is why I want to share this. This is what I'm going to take away from this interview because this man's story is so inspiring. Having said that, you say this thing in there that like I, I stopped it and I made my daughter watch it. Wow. There's a couple things. That How old is your daughter? 18. Okay. She's so I'm go, 15 and 17. I know. We're right in the same Whew. zone. So I relate to the stuff Whew. you talk about during COVID <laughs> and all the other stuff you talk about, right? Believe me, I relate to the frosting being off the cake and from Fat Ballerina. I relate to the cookie the other day where someone ate a half a damn cookie and, and left it on, it on the counter. counter. Yeah, all that stuff. Like The reason it's so funny is when you have kids, you relate to this. But the thing I really related to is you say, I got that thing. I yes. got that thing. Yes. And I'm like, Bella, watch this. Yes. This is what I've been trying to tell you right here. That thing. Your yes. dad's got that thing that sometimes it's like this dog in me, this relentless yes. thing that it's invisible, but it's tangible. It's a, it's this yes. thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I want you to talk to that because I think people watching this like, hey, they try to get these notes. This is what I need to do to be successful. This is what I got to do. I got to think this. I got to read this book. The mm -hmm. truth is underneath all that, you got to have that thing. You got to have that thing. It's that thing inside of you that it cannot be given to you. You have to find it. You can see it from others in the examples and you know that you've seen. I, my grandfather had that thing. Mm. My grandfather put all of us through college with an eighth grade education. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He laid asphalt in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm. And that was my summers from seven years old till 17. We went out and worked the summers with my grandfather laying 800 degree asphalt really? in the heat. That That's where I learned to get that thing. My stepfather who started the OJs yeah. and then quit the day before they made a million dollars and went on to watch them become the biggest thing ever, mm. right? And he went on to try to prove and, 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 and be a producer and never hit that level of success again. But I watched him chase that mm. every day. He had that thing. Yes. And yes. that thing is something that you have to find it. Mm. You know what I mean? And, yep. when, and, and, a lot, and it can only be given. When I got sober, mm. it was that thing mm. that told me I don't want to live like this no more. And mm. I deserve better because I grew up around greatness yeah so like why would i sell myself short and that's what i tell my daughters they play volleyball when they when whatever they try to from the volleyball from making friends from being better in school mm. you gotta have that thing inside of you because life is always coming for you that's so true yeah. and that's what i try to give them i said you ain't gotta be i listen i woke up at 29 years old that's when i decided that i wanted to be different is that right? Is that when you got sober? Yeah, I got sober at 20 and permanently. I mm -hmm. got sober twice yeah. before that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Once would last 18 months, the other lasted nine months. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this time I had started doing stand up and I knew inside that I had it, that I had what it took to be great. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I needed to drop that habit, I needed yeah. to get rid of that.